Cornell Cross Lincoln. Good evening. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Marcelo, Alexander, uh, to inviting to you, not me. <laughs> Unfortunately, couldn't make it, so I hope uh, you appreciate. Uh, at least I have longer hairs than to you. And I would like to thank the chairman. Now, the presentation I'm going to give you is uh, more clinical oriented in terms of optimizing the cross-linking light intensity profile. And before I start, you know, we, we need to think a little bit more different if we talk about keratoconus and cross-linking. There's a lot of discussion out there, shorter treatment times, you know, save the time of the surgeon. I think from my perspective and from our perspective is we need to get an effective treatment. It must be effective and safe, and this is, you know, what we're talking about. And let me guide you a little bit through our thought process and to our results we have when we can change the light profile of the illumination system to improve the efficacy of the treatment. So we're not going to talk too much about time here. We're talking about real outcomes, and we're talking about optimizing the outcomes for our patients. Now, what is the situation? For example, in a PMD, we do have um, the irregularities of the uh, cornea. And uh, we have a thinnest point that might be here. And we do have a steepest point. At which point would you do a, cr a cross-linking treatment? At the steepest point or the thinnest point? Now, if we follow a little bit the work from Renato Ambrosio on looking on the thickness profile in keratoconus, we have seen that in a keratoconic eye, the thickness profile is quite different to a normal eye. We have the thinnest point in the, th in the center, and towards the periphery, it gets thicker. And actually, at a diameter of about six millimeter, a keratoconic cornea has a similar diameter than a normal cornea. And that means we need to deal and think about a little bit different in those keratoconic eyes. And to get a maximum stiffness effect, we have to account the thickness profile to get a much maximum of volume that we can cross-link to make these corneas more stiffer. And on the other hand, we need to think where to place the treatment. So is the center of the pupil the right position? I don't think so. I think we need to think about the thinnest point as the center of the treatment. How much is this center dislocated? We looked on uh, a range of keratoconus patients, keratoconus, PM day. Actually, there's not too much difference, except that there, if you look at on the thinnest uh, pachymetry, versus the radial distance from the apex, you can see that there's quite a distance between the thinnest point and the apex. So the apex is not really a reference. We need to think about the thinnest point. So in the majority of the characteristic cases, the weakest point of the cornea that needs cross-linking the most is about one to three millimeter away from the center. And that's where we need to get the effect. Now, Historically speaking, if you have done treatments in the past with a cross-linking device, we have observed that the most effect we get is more or less in the center of the apex, because that's where we center our treatment, and that's where most of the illumination was applied. However, at the thinnest point, more or less over there, you can see at the demarcation line, it actually, the treatment area gets thinner. And over the thinnest point, we have practically not really an effect. So the light application towards the specific cornea is of relevance. So this is the demarcation line. And as you can see out here, we're just cross-linking maybe about 150 microns, where here we have about 300 microns of cross-linking. So if you look at the OCTs of 10 eyes, there's an homogeneity in the beam and the curvature. And there's a difference between the amount of cross-linking in the center versus the periphery. And if you do some calculations, you identify that about, we get about 25% less cross-linking in the periphery. That means 25% less light intensity in the periphery. And that's over a radial distance of about 3 million, which accounts pretty much to what Renato Ambrosio has told. We're getting in the range where we get the weakest point, we're getting less cross-linking in the periphery. So in order to create a homogeneous cross-linking effect, we have to change from a top head profile, from a, you know, a constant illumination over cornea, we have to change that and do more cross-linking in the periphery. 
So three millimeters away from the center, the light intensity needs to be increased by about 25%. So how does this look like? That was actually the initial cross-linking system that we brought into the market in 2007. We had a kind of a pretty much Gaussian-like profile. We believe that adding more light intensity see here, increasing the intensity in the periphery at about here, eight millimeters in diameter, six millimeters in diameter, getting more cross-linking in the periphery over the thinnest point here, we had kept at the same intensity. This will improve the outcomes. Compared to other systems, which have more a constant system, we're doing about 25 to 30% more cross-linking. How does this look like? So this is, again, the demarcation time line um, measured with the OCT. So here, it's about 300 microns. Here, it's about 300 microns. So we're getting a kind of very homogeneous, thickest layer. We are cross-linking over the cornea. We did a study in, in, in Zurich. Um, well, Professor Seiler did a study, to be honest. Um, he did the regular keratoconus, no scars, no preoperation. Standard indication for cross-linking. So progression was shown in those patients. The age was below 35 years. And the best corrected visual acuity was below 20, 25. 36 patients completed now a 12-month follow-up. That's about uh, uh, enrollment rate of 95%. To give you an example, a 20-year, uh, three-year male uh, with uh, uh, progression and the steepening of free diopter for one year with a thin cornea, 400 microns. Best corrected visual acuity was 0.25. And 12 months after we observed a significant flattening of about six diopters. And the best corrected visual acuity went back to pretty good functional vision of about 0.7, 20 over 30. That is topography. Here's the thinnest point. Again, the demarcation line. Oops, sorry. Demarcation line. Pretty homogeneous cross-linking at one month. This is a compa uh, comparison of the topography. Look, the steepest point here, 55 diopters, uh, down to about 52 diopters. Uh, difference maps, so at around six diopter flattening within the pupil. And that explains the improvement in visual acuity. So looking on the data, what we observed is um, about 95% received a flattening of one diopter or more, and a flattening rate of about two diopters more, that's 65%. That's much more than what they have ever seen before in standard cross-linking. In the periphery, the effect was always similar to central, so we're really getting kind of a homogeneous cross-linking profile in depth. Complications, the things that are observed is what you know from standard cross-linking procedures. So in conclusion, we believe the second generation cross-linking devices need to have a better understanding on the conditions of a keratoconic eye. It needs to adjust the light profile. We believe, of course, we can do things faster. However, we are focusing on an effectiveness here, and what we found is 10 milliwatt per centimeter squared is extremely effective compared to other experiments we did. And finally, based on the data we have seen so far, we believe, and we're getting more data from Arthur Cummings and from Dresden, we believe keratoconus now needs to be done in every keratoconus patient. Thank you very much for your interest. Okay. Maria Clara, we have uh, one minute. Do you want to ask any question? Yes, uh, I have a question. Yep. Uh, regarding the demarcation line, of your aim is to go deep 300 or more, as you see. Uh, uh, do you have data that document that this is the right quantity, or if we do less, we have similar effects? Uh, it's a good question whether if there's a thinner layer that we get a similar effect. And I would like to refer to great work from Gregor Wollensack, who looked on uh, if you only do a 100 micron cross-linking, he showed that the biomechanical stiffness effect is, was not statistically significant to a control. So if you do a more shallow cross-linking, the biomechanical uh, effect is not there. But stability, uh, how long we are checking in this? Because maybe the biomechanical effect is minimal, but if you achieve a stability, we don't need more. 
And I think this is a question that we have to, we all, all have oh, to ask. I, I understand, you, man. You, what your kind of claim is, we do less cross-linking, you might get the stability. I think from the data we have seen here, I would change the paradigm of cross-linking in terms of not only making it stable and making it better compared to before, flattening the cornea, improving the outcome in terms of reducing the cone. I'm totally agreed with making it better, but I have the feeling, it's a clinical feeling, I know have the yes, uh, research data in this, that we are doing too much. Too much in what sense? In terms of haze? Too deep. Cornea? No, too deep. So what is your concern on that? The change in the refractive power, because I think it for for um, I, it's ideal to do cross-linking with no refractive uh, change, to be able to manipulate with the laser. Oh, we didn't manipulate with the laser. It was just to be pure, able, yeah, to yeah. be able. I know said you did, oh, but to you, be oh, able. Oh, if you're talking about LASIK extra, or or rapid, uh, but uh, then then I think we should not talk about keratoconus patients. No, I'm talking about keratoconus patients. For LASIK extra. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Maria. <laughs> then, uh, thank you. Thank you. you we, uh, instead, you can explain during your, your talk also what, what is your feeling.